I'm so pleased. I'm Lynn Sanger, and uh, we've been working on this autism steering committee now for a couple of years. And it's so uh, exciting to have Metro, the Cleveland Clinic, and all of our community agencies involved in working on this. I'm very pleased today to introduce our speaker, who, if I can find my material here, is Dr. Cynthia Johnson, who is currently the director of the Learner Autism Center at the Cleveland Clinic. And in that role, she oversees over 125 staff members and provides strategic leadership to expand all of the programs, clinical education and research at the Cleveland Clinic Children's Center on Autism. Dr. Johnson comes to us with more than 20 years of experience in the field. She previously was director of the Autism Center Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and you remember we had Nancy Minshew here in the past, and she was an associate professor there. She then went on to the University of Florida and uh, became a full professor and worked on research there until she came here. She earned her doctoral degree from the University of South Carolina, had a postdoc uh, in child psychology from Johns Hopkins, and she's a licensed psychologist. She's going to speak to us today about really her many, many years, 14 years of work in research on autism and what she has learned and wants to share with us. So please welcome Dr. Cynthia Johnson. So um, thanks for having me. And since it's a small crowd today, feel free to raise a hand, ask a question as, as we go. And for any of you in the audience that's heard my, this talk, I've done it a few times since I've arrived in Cleveland. Um, well, I, I guess, you know, apologies that you're having to hear any, uh, anything twice or a third time, but you can be my reliability check to make sure I'm stating the facts right. Um, so I'm going to talk actually on some work we've done over the last 15 years um, on a program for disruptive behaviors in children with autism spectrum disorder. Um, for, and for any trainees out there, hopefully this is, can be some inspiration of starting some work um, that takes you down a path and builds um, on projects um, for some years, because I used to think 15 years was a long time now. It doesn't feel that long. All right, so I put in some objectives. We're just going to talk about a rationale for parent tra a parent training model and then the empirical base for parent training, um, specifically for, for children with ASD. Um, some Just to acknowledge our funders, um, and we want to keep them happy. Um, so these are funding through the years to work on this parent training um, work. And then just disclosures, one of our parent training manuals was recently published, and then we just published a, um, a book through APA on parent training. Um, so I'm just going to give a little bit of a historical um, backdrop of where all this work started. Um, so in the early 2000s, for those of you who were in the field, the, there was good news and bad news in the field of ASD. So we'd become much better at identifying young children with ASD, but at that time there were very few evidence-based treatments. And parents um, were and continue to be overwhelmed by treatment choices. So a recent Google showed um, a lots of hits, but again, the empirical base is just not there. And for our, inner, for our empirically based treatments, they're often very um, costly, time intensive, and personnel intensive, and certainly not available in many communities across the country. Um, and again, this is where we started. And at the time, again, early um, 2000s, there was a really strong pressing need um, to conduct clinical trials to test out empirically supported um, interventions that would be more time limited and cost effective. And with also the acknowledgement that we need not treatments just for core deficits in ASD, which I'm not going to talk about because I knew this was a crowd that didn't need to be um, reminded of core deficits, but we really didn't have treatments for the often um, co-occurring associated um, issues in ASD, which are oftentimes just as stressful to families as um, the core deficits. So the three in the white 
are areas that I've worked in, so disruptive behavior, which is the main focus today, sleep problems, and then feeding problems. I put anxiety in there because it's something we've tapped into. Um, and then if I don't remember to do it, somebody remind me just to talk about the association we found with anxiety and all three of these other three areas. So why parent training? Um, it, traditionally, it is a very time-limited approach. And, and again, when we started down this path, there was a very strong and is a strong literature of empirically-based treatments in, child, in general child mental health um, that shows this is a, a empirically-based treatment for primarily externalizing behavior disorders, again, and typically developing children. So we took that lead. Knowing, though, that parents of children with ASD need not only a toolkit of how to uh, address externalizing behaviors, but also those core deficits, um, along with adaptive functioning. And I'm going to get back to adaptive functioning in a minute. So again, um, this was a result of a um, ad hoc committee um, put together by National Institute of Mental Health, again, in early 2000s. 2000, um, several papers were um, issued with the call that we need to develop manualized interventions, we needed to collect feasibility, um, and then we needed to conduct large-scale multi, large multi-site studies and then disseminate those treatments. So this is our roadmap um, to move forward in the field of autism, um, treatments for autism. All right, so, but where we were at that time is that where there was a literature of small samples, um, non-randomized treatment, poorly characterized samples, um, and lack of manualized approaches. So these, these, these um, variables all hindered our replication. But we knew from the applied behavior analysis literature that, again, single subject, that these techniques could be taught to parents, to parents could use them effectively and get good results. All right, so um, the first trial we uh, started with was actually not a standalone of parent training, but a comparison of Respiridone with and without parent training. So Respiridone standalone, but Respiridone plus parent training. Um, I'm going to skip there. And here was our working model at the time. There had been a prior study showing the respiratory helped with irritability. So if we get irritability down, perhaps that would open up children's um, uh, a, a door to work on challenging behaviors and adaptive functioning. So again, irritability is down, which sets the stage for parent training. So many of you know this, but children with um, ASD, their adaptive functioning is often below where you'd expect based on cognition. So children with intellectual disabilities, their adaptive function is pretty similar. But in um, autism, it's much less. So was it a really a question of can we do it? We just won't do it. And parents ended up accommodating. So that was our hope for this study, um, is to show additive effects of parent training to medication. However, we ran into some of those barriers I just mentioned, so there was no manuals to go to. And that was my job on this project, along with a colleague in Pittsburgh, Ben Handen, to develop a program not to just to decrease um, uh, challenging behaviors, but to increase adaptive skills. And so, so we spent some time developing. And then NIH says, whoa, 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 before you start the randomized trial, we want you to test this to see if it's workable, it's feasible, you, can, you guys can pull it off. So we did that first with a very small number of uh, 12 um, participants. And we were able to say, yes, we can do this. Um, families stuck it out. They finished the um, 11 core uh, sessions, um, adhered to the program, and would uh, make recommendations to other parents. And so we moved on and conducted our randomized clinical trial, again, of Respiridone, or Respiridone plus the medication, 124 children, and I'm going to kind of breeze through these because I want to get to the most recent trial. So a slightly older group than what our last trial was, so 4 to 13 year old, old um, in the end it was a pretty young group. So this is a primary measure, it's called the home um, situation questionnaire. High is not good, low is what you want. So low, lower, the more improved the disruptive behaviors are. 
And you'll look in the early weeks of the um, study, medication was working really well, which kind of had us a little scared, like, ugh, where are you going to see any additive effects of the parent training? And in fact, we did, but not until we, uh, almost to the end of the trial, out in week um, 20 out to week 24. So that's when we got the spread, so where the combination was superior to medication alone, which makes sense. It, we're teaching parents new skills to then uh, apply and working with their child, it's going to take some time. There's some learning going on. Um, similar results with our other primary measure, which is a, a aberrant behavior checklist irritability scale. And again, that similar spread at the end of that trial. All right, so we pulled it off. Um, we had high fidelity, meaning we got therapists to be able to deliver the intervention um, across the five sites. Um, parents adhered, they got to the sessions, and we had low drop uh, dropout, 27%, which you could argue is low. We've done better in more recent years. Um, and again, the medication plus the parent training was superior to medication, and those children in the combined were able to stay um, on lower dose of medication, which for this medication is a good thing because there certainly are side effects. So our next step, we moved on, said that was great, we got some good effects, but again, it wasn't standalone. Um, and we started um, making adaptations to our parent training manual to be um, more um, relevant for younger children. Not huge changes, but our examples, our vignettes were young children, and we really thought of it as a more preventative model. Um, we made some additions and tweaking of the manuals. We, again, wanted to get um, federal funding for this, but we knew we needed to have pilot, um, pilot data on a younger sample. So we um, did a feasibility pilot study that was um, all the children were from Yale, and um, they were three to seven-year-olds. And we were able, again, to say, hey, we can pull this off. We had high fidelity. Um, low attrition, um, and the parents um, reported that they would recommend it to other families. Okay, so this is what we, where we ended up. We have um, 11 core sessions, and many of those sessions, I'm sure the topics look very familiar to you guys. It might be what you do in some of your clinical work. I will tell you that over the years, we have fussed and fussed about the order of the sessions. Um, it's what happens when you put a bunch of ABA kind of people in the same room with strong opinions. We landed on this order, but there was agreement. Again, we felt we wanted this to be manualized, but also very individualized. So a therapist, after the, those first two sessions, could go out of order. Um, we talked a lot about these on um, cross-site um, weekly therapy um, calls to sort of come to an agreement, a consensus, that that was the right th thing to do for a particular family. So in addition to those 11 core sessions, we also had some optional session materials for issues that might pop up for, that are common in children with ASD. We also made two home visits, one in the beginning and the end, and then a couple of booster sessions. So that was the format of our parent training um, program. Things that were unique was we really capitalized on using visual schedules, um, and also different than uh, parent training manuals for externalizing disorders. We worked with families on helping them understand the function of their child's behavior, took a strong communi a functional communication approach, and not just emphasized lowering excessive behaviors, but working on adaptive um, new skill acquisition. Um, and then a focus on generalization and maintenance, which is challenging in this population. All right. We also had vi vi uh, video vignettes that accompanied the um, manual. Our, uh, our technology behind making these uh, vignettes has improved over the years. Um, so they either depicted um, just an example of how um, supplemented direct instruction, more of them showed a parent making some uh, an erroneous, um, making an error in um, executing a strategy, and the parent we worked with was supposed to identify that. And we hope that it just, you know, enhanced the session, made it a little more lively, as well as improved acquisition of the technique. And I think I have one of these. Let's see here. So this is one of our vignettes. 
I have a brownie. Oh, not right now, honey. All right, it's lunchtime. But why? Because it's lunchtime. It's not time for brownies. Open it. I said it's not time for brownies. All right, you can have one, one brownie. That's it now. Just an example of a vignette early on of parents needing to identify, you know, okay, now what's gonna happen after that happened and what's the function of that child's behavior? Um, I already pointed to this, but we made a very um, conscious decision to make this very personalized. This was individually delivered. And we knew that um, children coming in were gonna be, you know, it's a sh uh, the, the age interval was preschoolers, but there were gonna be children of different functioning level, families with different needs. And these children, even though by definition had challenging behaviors, disruptive behaviors on one of our measures, their specific target behaviors were, could be quite different. So we had um, ways to make sure it was individualized for those children. So it's a control trial, right? So we had to also come up with what our control condition was. This is what we came up with, and we've actually used it in some other trials since, and it's worked surprisingly well. So our control condition, we can't give a placebo, right? We need to control for time and attention. So we came up with a parent education program. Many of the participants we thought coming into this trial would be children with a relatively new diagnosis. So we started off talking to families, a whole individual session on what the diagnosis means, moving on to things like how do you interpret all these evaluations your children, child gets and how do you interpret you know, what a standard score is, et cetera, um, all the way down to um, etiology, um, how to pick uh, effective treatments, how to advocate for your child. What we didn't talk about is that child's specific target behaviors. And if you notice, our last sessions were around choosing evidence-based treatments and how to plan treatment. We purposely put that at the end because if, in fact, we leaked a little bit um, in terms of how to address a child's per, um, behavior, it was towards the end. Um, we were all like, well, this is a great control, but our concern was families would enter the study, get randomized to parent education, and drop out. It didn't happen, but hold on till I'll tell you what happened. Okay, I think I made these points. I always make these points too early. So NIMH wanted full control for attention, newly um, parents or newly diagnosed. So it was really more of, of an active comparator versus a tr control. Um, but again, we worked real hard not to talk about behavior management, which is hard for some of us that were therapists because that's what we do. Um, again, just a comparison on the intervention targets for parent training. We were t um, working on reducing challenging behaviors and increasing those adaptive skills. Parent ex education was expanding that parent's knowledge of ASD. Um, again, both individually delivered 60 to 90 minutes in a clinic setting. Um, therapists all had a didactic um, script that they went by. Um, activity sheets for the parents, the video vignettes, um, role playing between the clinician and parent, and individually tailoring homework at each session. And I should point out, the child was not, uh, didn't have to come to all the sessions. We had the child come at different assessment points, and we did some parent-child coaching. But oftentimes, parents came without the child. So the primary paper of this trial came out in 2015, so time's just blowing by. Um, and it was, we were fortunate enough to have it published in JAMA, which is a feat for a child something to be published in JAMA, and then ASD. Um, so what, what was the outcome? So again, a 24-week trial. Comparison, comparing the two groups, we did do follow-ups at week 36 and 48. All right. 
So this was our inclusion criteria. For those of you who know the aberrant behavior checklist irritability, these were pretty disruptive, irritable children to in, in, be included. They could be on medication, but it had to be stable. They also had to be on a treat, uh, stable tr treatment plan. So if they were getting ready to start a preschool program, we just waited six weeks until they got in the pro program. We also, I should point out, stratified for level of intensity outside of us. Um, in the two groups. So we kept the two groups equal about who was low intensity versus high. Um, these were our out, similar outcome measures we had used for earlier trials, so the aberrant behavior checklist, home questionnaire, and the Vineland adaptive behavior scale. So again, parents obviously knew what they were getting, but we did have an independent rater who um, was um, masked to treatment group. So they met with the parent throughout the study at different time points. They were um, privy to all the measures, and they made a judgment on the global um, clinical global impression scale about whether the child had in improved or not improved. Um, and um, our definition of a treatment with sponder was much or very much improved. For, so pretty stringent definition. Other people have used mild improvement as a treatment with responder. We chose not to. And I also have to point out how challenging it is to keep um, uh, um, evaluators mass. So, I mean, it, we had to go to the extent of moving offices around and having binders such that they couldn't detect what group assignment they were in. We had to coach families what not to say when they talked to the evaluator. We usually had a coordinator in with the evaluator so we could kind of give nonverbals if the parent was about to say something they shouldn't. Um, so we couldn't have families going in saying, well, you know, since we've been using that visual schedule, things are much better. Um, but we felt like we were really successful at pulling this off. Families actually got sort of into it. They enjoyed sort of tricking the evaluator. Um, and again, just a reminder of the layout of the 24 weeks for the two groups. I won't go into all the statistical analyses. Um, it was randomized one-on-one. -on -one. I mentioned that we stratified for um, intensity of services outside of parent training. Um, and I already talked about our blinding. Um, this was the flow of patients through the trial. So to get our 180, we screened 267. And when I speak with other groups, sort of non-autism groups that do clinical trials, they think, oh, you know, 180 children is, is not large and it's not compared to a lot of clinical trials work, but this was uh, an enormous amount of work um, with four to five sites recruiting us. Some of us moved around during the trial. Um, so we, our goal was to randomize 180 um, participants, which is what we do, did. We're able to hang on to most of them, and even those that exit um, early in the trial, we were able to get um, uh, some of the outcome measures at week 24 for analyses. Mostly boys, no surprise to this crowd. A young group, uh, four and a half. 74% uh, had IQs over 70, which I want to point out has been what we've seen in our trials. Um, every time we get review, a manuscript review, people say, oh, well, you just had a high-functioning group. And I say, no, this is really the trend, which I would like to say hats off to all the other intervention children are getting that I think we're offsetting um, lower IQs. Um, a pretty white group. Um, this was DSM-4 still, so we had it broken down by autistic disorder, PDD, and Asperger's, but 70% had um, autistic disorder. 46% were in regular ads, and 20% were on medications. I'm just flashing these baseline characteristics to say the two groups were very similar across the measures at the time of baseline. Um, maybe to point out, out too, you know, we had uh, uh, a high, high percentage with IQs over 70, but their adaptive behaviors were low. All right. So at the time this was published, it was the largest psychosocial um, trial conducted in ASD. It ended up being six sites um, with folks moving, 23 therapists in all, and 180 children. 
So similar to that earlier trial, but again, this is standalone, um, on our aberrant behavior checklist, irritability, um, you know, everybody got a little better. So parent education um, decreased on that measure, but uh, um, parent training was superior and decreased in disruptive behaviors with a pretty large effect size of 0.62. Um, similar for the home situation questionnaire, but again, keep an eye towards parent education. There are certainly children that benefited from that, our con control condition. This is the CGI. So CGI, again, is the Clinical Global Impression Scale, um, where that, that's the independent evaluator who didn't know treatment assignment, and we, they were rated as, at each of these time points, much improved or very much improved. So nearly 70% of our children in the parent training group were responders compared to 40% in parent education. And we've got some nice effects on the Vineland daily living skills, right? So we got those disruptive um, behaviors down that opened up the child to hopefully learn or at least perform already acquired daily living skills. Um, so the parent education group went significantly up, so up's good here, um, compared to the parent education, which pretty much stayed the same. All right, uh, again, fidelity was high. Um, for both groups. Um, so we got all those 23 therapists over the five year study to deliver both of our manuals in a consistent fashion. So that's great, but does it last? And we think so. Um, so 79% of our responders still were responders out at week 48. And then 70% of our responders to the parent education. And surprisingly, even our negative responders, they didn't at least get worse. So they stayed there. All right, so how about parents? So we were really interested that, you know, we asked parents to come in and do a lot of work in that parent education group. They came in 11 sessions at least. Um, had to get themselves there, had homework assignments weekly, which they were co-collaborators. Um, but did it, how did it help parents, or did it just help children? And there's a, a literature saying that you know, children with ASD, the parents of children with ASD have extraordinarily high stress levels, and it makes sort of intuitive sense that if we can help parents that we, their stress levels will come down. But it's not actually been directly shown that as a result of intervention, do parents' stress come down? I um, might have already said this. Um, yeah, I said it all. And the, you know, the parent training, I mean, the parent stress literature in ASD is, is a little messy. Um, anyhow, so we had several um, parent stress measures that we felt, you know, our hypothesis going into this was that parent training would result in lower um, parental stress than the other. And it's pretty much what we showed. This paper just came out last year. These are our parent training measures. Some of them probably look familiar, particularly that parenting stress index, but we also use something called the parenting sense of competence and um, caregiver strain questionnaire. And these measures were given at three time points. All right, I'm not gonna tell you what all these are about. I'm gonna flash up demographics just to say, at baseline, parent demographics were very similar. Um, mom showed up almost exclusively. Um, very educated group. Uh, more demographics. And again, their um, at baseline parenting stress and parenting sense of competence were similar. So for those of you who know the parenting stress, these scores come out to the 99th percentile for stress, so about as high as you can score on that measure. Um, the good news is parents stayed in in both groups. Um, I'm gonna flash that, oh, here we go. So parenting stress, so sort of, this is the total score. So not significant finding. So that was a little disappointing. Parent training is lower, but not significantly so. So we look more closely at the subscales of this measure and what was driving that downward, uh, more downward score in parent training was the difficult um, child uh, subscale, which then you look at the other two subscales, parental distress and dis dysfunctional interactions. 
What this means for me clinically is that we help families feel better about the, the challenges around um, challenging disruptive behaviors, but it's still pretty stressful to parent a child with ASD. But on our sense of our measure of confidence, they felt more confident in parenting that child. So this was significantly, um, parent training was um, significantly higher on this measure. All right, I'm not gonna do the subscales. Um, so overall, you know, our parent training appears to have improved parents' perceptions of their ability to handle the day-to-day -day challenging behaviors of their child compared to the other group. However, it's a very high SES group, um, but very distressed. Um, they did attend with high um, rates and stuck with it. Um, and I think I've said all that. So highlights of this trial, before I mention a, where, what now, is uh, it was the largest psychosocial trial and parent training was superior than parent education on, on parent ratings as well as that blinded clinician. And we maintained those over time. Surprise, which is I alluded to in the beginning, was how well parent education performed. So less dropouts in this group than in parent education, and much more improvement than we expected. So the question is, for some parents, is just providing them more information about their child, about autism, about how to go about getting help. Is that a pathway for them to for improve disruptive behaviors? They just understood their child more. Um, all right, so limitations I always mention too early, um, but we did have high reliance on parent measure, parent completed measures, but we had that blinded um, rater. Um, and it was under the best optimal, optimal conditions. So therapists were well trained before they were allowed to take a study patient. And then we acknowledged it was a select sample that could get themselves to a clinic setting um, for the, the, the 11 sessions. All right, I already said that. All right, so what are we going to do now? Um, our hope now is to figure out how to implement more broadly in community settings so it doesn't just stay with us. I do have uh, colleagues who have been trying it out in a group setting, um, also in a telehealth. And then we're working on a train the trainer model, so an implementation um, application where we can go out and train people and see how what the uptake is in a less than optimal, less than optimal settings. Um, and I've also taken this model to use it, look at other co-occurring um, problems, which includes sleep. So I did a pilot trial a few years ago um, with some funds from National Institute of Mental Health. We just were funded to do this, again, delivery, same intervention, but delivered by telehealth. There's brochures out there if you can find any families. It's telehealth, so families can live anywhere. We started enrolling, and I'm, I'm seeing, meaning on express care, um, families from Florida, from other, a lot of people in Ohio, um, but across the country, so that's kind of fun. Um, we're working out the glitches in telehealth, or, or my lack of technology savvy. Um, we've also applied the parent training to feeding problems in children with ASD. Um, this was a wait list study. I think I have a little bit on this. Um, so not as strong of a tri trial, so we just compared active treatment to a wait list. Um, and again, similar format. We had scripts and activity sheets and video vignettes. Um, I'll come back to that. And then I'll show you a couple of videos from this. And your job is to see what you notice different here of these vignettes. And the best thing for us as parents um, through feeding therapy is probably the knowledge that we received. I mean, I feel like I have a master's degree in this now. I mean, I've learned so much being able to um, ask questions on a weekly basis and learn all these strategies. And you know, it wasn't easy at first. I was a disaster. I, I, I'll admit it. I force fed my kid. I would hold him down and forth because I needed him to eat. And that's just where we were. And then finding these new strategies where it was no stress was great. F family dinners were fun again, and they weren't stressed. I wasn't worried. I wasn't up at night wondering, is he going to eat? Do we have to put him on a feeding tube because he's not going to eat anything? So 
really, it's been a huge blessing. So don't answer my question on that one. So I always say this, that, that video is like our sales pitch at the beginning, session A. Um, almost kind of has a feel of sort of motivational interviewing, right? All right, so here's the one. You can tell me what error the mom made and what you noticed differently about this vignette. If I tell you, if you take a bite, you can have ice cream, would you eat it? Yeah? If you take a bite of chicken, you can have ice cream after dinner? No. How about if you take a bite of chicken, you can go to SeaWorld? No. I want you to stand up. You what? Mm -hmm. You want to stand up? Where are you going? So our prompt to that would say, well, what advice might you give that mom? Who here wants to volunteer what might tell mom? Yeah, sure. There seems to be a large delay between the right. behavior that she wants him to do and the reinforcement. Right, right. Yeah. right. Right. She's making a lot of mistakes, but that, that was the biggest one we were trying to highlight there. And it was funny because right after we made these videos, I moved to Florida. I'm like, this is so appropriate, right? Because talking about SeaWorld. Um, what else did you notice there? Maybe over this video, over that earlier video I showed for that earlier trial. So these children actually had autism. And it was not my idea. All of our others have been staged. You know, we've hired um, act, uh, child actors and been sort of staged and scripted. Um, this project was with the University of Rochester, and they had, I think it was their video person, said, let's just go in and videotape children eating. I was like, oh, this is so not going to work. We're not going to get what we need. It's going to take too long. We're going to fall, fall behind in our timeline. And the videos are so much better, though, because they're, they're authentic. Um, so we just videoed families at mealtimes and just let them go. And then we picked out pieces that we felt like would highlight a skill. The problem is sometimes they're a bit messier because this mom also has a bunch of stuff on the table and, you know, she's chatting with them about other things. So then we had to go through and kind of come up with a list of things that might be quite right. The other one were just sort of cleaner in what we were trying to highlight. But I think they were such much more engaging and effective in the long run. Oh, we don't need to wash it again. Hold on. All right. So in this study, very small trial, we randomized 42 children. Our, our hope had been 50. We didn't quite meet it. Um, we had a few exit. They were all mine in Florida, unfortunately, because, um, again, this was a two-site study between University of Florida and Rochester. And this was our primary measure on this um, for this trial. So the Bambi is a, a parent-completed measure of um, mealtime behaviors. Um, and our parent training was superior to wait list. We also had something called about your child's eating, which again, the parent training group was superior than the wait list. Um, and then we, of course, had to have the clinical global impression scale, very similar in terms of how we um, defined it, our responders. But what I have to add to this is we had, we, you know, struggled with um, if the child's behavior at mealtime, but yet they're not eating anything more nutritional. Is that really enough? Is that good? So we had this very complicated rating where we had a dietitian rate the nutrition, and then we looked at all the behavior measures to come up with a global rating um, for our, 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 um, our mass um, rater. And I don't know how well it worked, but you know, I think we still need to work on that. Um, what I will, oh, I don't, I don't disclose it. What I will say in this trial is that when we looked at nutritional data, we didn't see significant improvements. We're still figuring out other ways to look at that data. You know, um, explanations could be a. You know, it's just not enough time to see a nutritional bump, even though the child's behaviors are improved around meal times, and they might be open to eating some new foods. It's just not enough to get a bump in nutrition. Um, I just had a call with Rochester about this last week, and we're still, I'm not a nutritional person, so I'm looking to them for, like, how did you decide how good nutrition is.
Um, so what's next? Along with our sleep study, we are just getting ready to do a comparison study, a comparative effectiveness trial of early intervention sort of treatment as usual to what we're calling adaptive ABA, or more, more recently we've we're referring to it as MABA, modified ABA. And in that, we're comparing sort of early intervention, early intensive behavior intervention, sort of at treatment as usual, compared to more modular approach incorporating our parent training programs where parents, it's less intensive, but parents have um, a voice along the way in what they, um, they uh, vote on as important to them, as well as what we're calling tailoring measures to um, pick and choose from a menu of um, interventions to target those um, co-occurring behaviors. Um, so w the uh, EIBI, as usual, will be 15 to 25 hours, whereas our comparison is um, 10 hours a week of treatment. So the advantage for families to enroll is everybody gets treatment. Um, and 10 hours is still often more than many children get out in the community. And it's a comparative effectiveness. Now, so we're not looking to say which is superior, but, or, but are they about the same for some children. So that's what we're going to work on the next four years um, and hopefully recruiting for um, very soon. And I think that's it. So I can answer any questions. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Thoughts? Disagreements? Yeah. Thank you. That was wonderful. Can you tell me, so the parent engagement versus parent, parent education versus parent training, you said that there was less um, dropout with that. Why? What's yeah. different about that? You know, it, it's not enough difference to say it was a big deal, you like it wasn't significant, but here's some thoughts, was A, parents found it inform, um, the information helpful, and B, in that um, treatment arm, we weren't working parents so much, right? So in parent training, we were asking parents to change their behavior. Their children sometimes got worse before they got better, right? Because these are families, because their children's behavior was so disruptive, had resulted in doing a lot of accommodation, not asking their child to ask them to do much. And then all of a sudden, we're saying, OK, we want you to ask them to, to do these 10 things next week. So I think it was it's a demand issue. So there was a homework component. Mm -hmm. for, uh, Parents had to do homework, put demands on their child, um, use a visual schedule. I'm just trying to think of the sessions, work on functional communication. And then they had to come back and fess up how well they did it. Right. right? And that was not part of parent education. No, for that no, we just had nice chats and shared information and, you know, Frankly, so the, oftentimes they brought their children and we babysat for their children, right? It was like they had our ear, they had the ear of somebody with specialization in autism for a whole hour without any distractions. And for some of these families, that might have been like an hour babysitting. Sure. Right? Okay. right. Okay, so the time was not necessarily balanced, it was balanced in appointment. Right. But not outside of appointment. There was more. No, time that's a good time. point. That's a really good point. Yeah, the requirements outside were different. Yeah, yeah. So, are you thinking about how you take then the parent education component? You're, it sounds like you're following through with both of them moving forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so it's interesting. So the, I, I, just as a side, the parent education. Many, many people have asked us if we'll hand it over for them to use. And we said, well, maybe we should try to publish it. But and then we had some call. And we we're like, well, it's a little outdated. Before we give it away, we should update it. I'm like, are you kidding me? We've got other work to do. I can't be updating stuff for other people's research. So we've, we've given it away with the caveat that some of this is outdated, right? And in fact, for the sleep study, I'm doing a, it's only because the sleep um, parent training is only five session. I have five session of parent education. And one of those sessions is on sleep hygiene. So it's to mimic what traditionally happens. A child goes for one outpatient appointment to a sleep medicine person and gets some general recommendations, right? But the other four sessions are taken, they're t um, t topics taken from that. And I was, I'm doing it right now. Um, and 
And we, I had a section that I wrote, you know, a few years ago on prevalence, but that's changed. And what we need to say about etiology has changed. And then the, the, the Ruby trial, the disruptive behavior trial, was written in DSM-4. So we had autism diagnosis was all based on DSM-4. And midway in the, in the trial, it changed. You're like, oh, we better go change that. Um, so yeah, so, so those things keep moving. And then the other thing just to highlight, so this was, the Ruby study was five sites. Well, we had a session all on how you advocate for your child, where you go, et cetera. Well, that's different in different states. So we had to have some, we had to hand tailor those sections per site to be helpful to families. Um, I have to say one of my favorite, and then I'll tell you one of my one session that I really dislike doing, and I, I'm not using it in any other studies. So my favorite session is towards the end when we talk to families about how to identify empirically based treatments. So we go through our script and you know talk about testimonials all the way down to single subjects and then randomized trial. And the homework, actually, this is one of the few times they had homework, was to go on Google or wherever, on the computer, internet, and come up with an intervention they were interested in and tell us the next session about what the level of empirical basis was. And I remember I worked with a family, and they had done, uh, well, I don't want to step on any toes, but it was not something I would consider empirically based. But it was so powerful because a mom goes, I'm so upset. I tried that. I paid for that. And look, I should have gone to Google first. So it was a very useful thing that they could take with them down the road. The session I like um, least is the session on talking about um, developmental course. So across a lifespan, what parents might expect. And here's why. It, you know, as young children, newly diagnosed, it was way too much information there. They needed to be thinking about their child for preschool and kindergarten, not what they were going to be like as an adolescent, nor can we make those predictions, right? So I, I really protested continuing to do that session. I mean, but there were some um, parent training that d did it that thought it was useful. So that was just me, but I'm standing by it. <laughs> well, thank you oh, so you're much. welcome. Thanks for having me.